My name is Franklin Leonard. Um, and I live in Los Angeles, California, and I work in the American film industry, um, Hollywood, um, which home to such extraordinary artisanal pursuits as Transformers 4 and Fast and Furious 7. Um, yes, that was supposed to be a laugh line. Um, needless to say, it's a bit odd for me to be here as part of the global campaign uh, for the Alliance uh, for Artisans. Um, odd enough that when I was actually asked to come and speak, uh, my initial reaction was to push back and say essentially, are you sure I'm the right person for this? Um, and, and thankfully, they encouraged me that, in fact, I am, and hopefully in five minutes I can explain why that's the case. Um, and, and actually, very quickly, uh, to Greta and Peggy and Ambassador Russell, thank you uh, for, for having me do this, and hopefully I can validate your decision to do so. Um, so 10 years ago, I was working at Leonardo DiCaprio's film production company, and my job was to find great screenplays so that I could give them to my bosses and they could go make those movies. And about a year into that job, I found that I was not finding very good screenplays, which meant that I was in a position professionally that was relatively unfamiliar to me. Uh, I was not very good at my job, um, which was a problem both from a sort of self-esteem perspective, but also from a perspective of my mother was calling me every week and asking me whether law school was still an option. Um, and I really didn't want to go to law school. Um, and so, faced with that prospect, I sent an email to 75 of my peers and asked them to send me a list of uh, 10 of their favorite screenplays from that year that hadn't yet been produced. Um, I wasn't asking for the scripts that they thought would make a lot of money. I wasn't asking for the scripts they thought their bosses would like. I was asking them, for, very simply, for a list of the scripts that they loved, that made them feel something. Um, and all 75 of those people emailed me their lists. I aggregated them, you know, ran them through Excel, a pivot table, and then output them to PowerPoint. And I'd send them back out to everybody that participated um, under a quasi-subversive name, The Blacklist, again mentioned by the voice of God, um, that was a sort of double reference to the writers who had been silenced during the McCarthy era here in the United States, and a conscious inversion of the idea that black somehow needed to signify a negative. Um, and very quickly it became a thing, even though I hadn't really given much thought to it. Um, people were talking about these screenplays, they were talking about these writers. Um, normally at this point in the story I would sort of expand the, uh, the story, but I only have five minutes so I'm going to get right to the crux of it, which is this. Um, I've done this list for the last ten years, and a strange thing has happened. Um, the writers on it get jobs, a lot of jobs, and the scripts that were on this list get made with a great deal of frequency. And what's strange is that these scripts are oftentimes the sort of weird, emotionally ambitious human stories that everyone in Hollywood is surprised get made. They're the stories of a young Indian boy living in the slums who goes on who wants to be a millionaire. They're the stories of the gay cryptographer who is arguably the most important person in the 20th century, Alan Turing. Um, I'm referring to my notes here, because it's necessary sometimes. Um, and these movies, which include Juno, Little Miss Sunshine, Slub Dog Millionaire, Argo, uh, The Imitation Game, uh, The King's Speech, all do quite well uh, financially as well. And, and so I'm sure at this point you're wondering why this matters to you, a group of assembled artisans and supporters of artisans who I imagine are as skeptical of Hollywood films and the people who make them as I am instinctively. Um, well, I think it's important to remember, and it's something that I forget all the time, is that essentially movies are highly orchestrated groups of artisans coming together to create a bigger product. Um, they are people who are experts at their craft, toiling away, usually in obscurity, making costumes, making props, in the case of most of the people that I work with, writing screenplays. Um, and yes, some of those people are very, very well compensated for their work, and they end up on television during Oscar season, and they get to speak to the world, but the vast majority of them are toiling away in obscurity to do one very simple thing, to tell a story. Um, there have been about a thousand screenplays on my annual list over the last 10 years. About 300 of them have been produced. Those movies have made about, those movies have been nominated for over 200 Oscars and won 43, including three of the last seven best pictures and eight of the last 16 screenwriting Oscars. Um, and all told, they've made a ton of money. Today we're going to hear, and we've already heard quite a bit about the economic value of the creative economy. For me, it's self-evident, and it's not something that I really want to belabor. Um, there are far smarter people, economists, I assume, uh, who can put 
a very high number on what that value is. Uh, for me, when I look at these numbers, and when I think about the $25 billion that the movies that have, been, that have come from scripts on the blacklist uh, have made, I see something different. I see the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people that have seen those films, um, either in theaters or in some sort of post-theatrical environment like DVD or streaming or, yes, illegal downloads. Um, it's always in the mind of people in Hollywood. Um, and I think about the fact that those tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people, see the world a little bit differently when they leave those stories than they did when they went in. Um, they have an experience, however briefly, of being a stuttering prince, of being an Indian kid in the slums, of being a great, crypto great cryptographer, and they're able to recognize the common humanity of those imaginary characters and the people they actually encounter when they leave the theater and go out into the world. Um, and so too it is, I think, with the work of artisans. Um, we are, at the end of the day, um, quasi-highly evolved animals that are ill-equipped to live in the physical environments in which we find ourselves, something I was reminded of walking over here in the humidity. Um, but we all adorn our bodies with fabric. We all adorn our bodies with jewelry. Um, we all eat food. We consume drink. We listen to music. We play to with toys or games, uh, and we all tell stories in some form or another. Um, artisans, I think, represent the highest representation of our common humanity. Um, and they are the carriers of the traditions that allow us to continue to evolve that humanity um, and that connectedness as we move into the future. Um, in 2015, we live in a very highly connected world, even though it remains quite fractious. Um, and I think that artisans quite excitedly um, remind us of who we are as human beings. And I think that may be unquantifiable, but in aggregate, it's also undeniable. And probably even more valuable than any number you could possibly put on the economic value of the creative economy, no matter how many zeros it has. So, Thank you for uh, giving me five minutes of your time this morning. Thank you for all of the work that you do as makers, uh, as supporters of makers, and as the uh, mirror that remind us all that we are all a lot more similar than we are different. Thank you.